Aditamastu Mavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. As Swami Vivekananda said, where shall we go to find God if not in our own hearts and in every living being. So we're studying Swami Prabhavananda's collection of talks published as Realizing God. We've just started his talk on mysticism and mystic visions or super consciousness. We've come a ways in and he will start with this question why should I have to see God and realize him? Why should I have to see God and realize him? What is the effect? The effect is this. The knot of ignorance in the heart becomes loosened. All doubts cease to exist. All effects of deeds of the past, present, and future are wiped out. Now, you've heard me say over and over that these realized souls have the right to make these stupendous promises. So why should I have to see God and realize him? What is the effect? The effect is this, the knot of ignorance in the heart becomes loosened. All doubts cease to exist. All effects of deeds of the past, present, and future are wiped out. Now, before we go on, is there anyone who would like to add to that from their own experience or ask a question about it because this is the promise that justifies what the swami is going to tell us is the need for effort and how we will actually come to this uh, state of knowledge and peace Brother Shankara, this is Haima. Yes, <laughs> and the knot of ignorance resonates with me as a false ego, which is unripe and ego, probably. I'm thinking, I, I just want to clarify with you. Well, is that's, that one, that's, that's one of the I'm aspects saying. of the knot of ignorance. Uh, it, it, we, we can generalize it and mm -hmm. say that it is the unripe ego. But and also the detachment process, probably desireless state, which is sensual pleasures. Yes. Detachment of the sensual pleasures. Uh, the, the, our ignorance has to do, as you pointed out, with what can be summed up as the unripe ego, which is, what is that? That is attachment and aversion that is pride, yes, vanity, mm -hmm. uh, in all of its forms. 
and our tendency to have real belief in the universe and world that we project, which of course is based on our samskaras, based on our past deeds, past thoughts, speech and action. So all of this is compounded as the knot of ignorance. Thank you. And the Swami is saying, and, and very well said what you said, Hyman, you know, the detachment and the maturation of the ego. ego. But we can't jump from square one to the center. It is a process. It is, a, as Swami Sri Dharananda would remind us again and again, it happens slowly and slowly, my dears. We go is from he... the state of I am sure. to the state of that or he or she is, speaking of the divine being, in, in a series of stages. This means the surrendering to Atman, then we release the knot of ignorance, then we, we have to surrender to our Atman. Atman. Godward turn. Turn towards Godward. Surrendering, surrendering to Atman is such a such a loaded phrase. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed, that's true. But what does surrender mean? So what does surrender mean? Oh, it means releasing. Started. It means releasing all of those other things. Other things. Particularly our opinion that our watch, as Sri Ramakrishna says, tells the right time. Okay. That what we know and believe of the world and the universe and is the right answer. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Shankar. That makes sense. Anything else from anyone about this business of this great promise that the Swami has made? Uh, I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this idea of spiritual experience and its relationship to uh, releasing the knot of ignorance mm -hmm. as opposed to because um, like I've had spiritual experiences before, but I keep reading from various texts that enlightenment or God realization is not an experience. So well, do you think you can clarify there, that? It, there are three levels of self-realization the first the discovery of the self that you find oh my goodness there is this other presence that i had only the slightest indication was there it is the self, or as Haima used the term Atman, the witness consciousness. So first is that. That is an experience. It is within time, space, and causation. There is an experience, an experiencer, and the experience itself. The next level is it comes under the general heading of Savikalpa Samadhi. Still, it is an experience, but it is the experience that there is nothing else but that presence that has been discovered. There is nothing, that's all that there is, and that the self that you know, the, the witness self, the Atman or witness self is part of that, part of that, like a slice cut from a pie, but not removed from the pie. 
but when you have the experience of Savikalpa Samadhi, and it is an experience, then you everything else, everything else is pushed to the periphery. That's all that is within your awareness at that time. But it's like the parable goes in, you know, that's told by Sri Ramakrishna. And of course, it's an old, old parable out of the um, scriptures. Uh, that when you take your bath in the Ganges, all you're purified, totally purified. But all of the impurities go roost like birds in the trees. And when you return out of the Ganges, they return also and, and take residence in you. Savikalpa Samadhi is not the final solution. But it is such an encouraging experience that you're much more prone to continue with your spiritual practices until finally something that is indescribable happens. The reason it's indescribable is there is no describer there. There is no witness consciousness. You have become pure consciousness. He who knows Brahman becomes Brahman. This is Nirvikalpa Samadhi. But when asked about Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Swami Prabhupada said, well, first achieve Savikalpa, and then we'll talk about Nirvikalpa. And he could tell by looking in your eyes, literally by looking in your eyes, whether you had had the experience of Savikalpa Samadhi. So Anshu and anyone else who's interested in this answer, these are the three levels of first discovery of the self. And that in itself is the, when, it, when it really, you really become aware of its presence and see how experience, how much vaster it is than your small ego self. This is when Sri Ramakrishna says the ego becomes like a small, like a shy child. And this begins this process of loosening the knots of ignorance because a shy child a shy five-year-old is not, as Sri Ramakrishna says, possessed by the gunas. So there's less insistence. The child may be willful in a moment, but it really doesn't signify much. So then having discovered the self, this the continued spiritual practice gives you this experience of the self as all that is, and yourself as a part of that. Is that is that a good clarification, Anshu? Uh, it was very good. Just uh, so the relationship to ignorance, though ignorance does not disappear until nirvikalpa samadhi, or does it disappear at? You know what I? You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I do. I know that's what I meant about bathing in the Ganges. The 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 aspects of ignorance perch like birds in the trees, and they come back. But if you fail to water them with your attention, this is the this is the key. They will they will try, but much more weakly now, much more feebly. 
they will try to make their presence felt. Gotcha. But as Sri Krishna says in the Gita, <laughs> you know, the the winds of the senses, the the power of the senses, very strong, can drive even a sta an established ship off its course. So we need to continue our spiritual practices with dedication day in and day out as best we can to stay established in that which we have discovered when we discover the self and then uh, when savikalpa samadhi comes and it will come this is this not just the promise of swami prabhavananda but all of the swamis will tell you if you ask them directly if I keep up my spiritual practices, will this Savikalpa Samadhi come? Their answer will be yes. If you stick on, it will come. Then what happens next? And this is very well described by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. The first six steps of yoga that result in this Savikalpa Samadhi are seemingly, I say seemingly, because if we believe in the scriptures and in what the great teachers tell us, God alone is the doer, but nevertheless, it seems to us that we're making an effort. So the first six steps are something that is a matter of self-effort, Purushakara. The last two, which are samadhi, this nirvikalpa samadhi, and liberation, are something Patanjali says that happens to you. Anything else from anyone? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So the three components, are they um, the experiencer, experience, and the experienced? Yes. And uh, are experience and experienced uh, different always? Well, there's the experiencer, the experience itself, and then that which has been ex experienced the samskara that's left, that which stays with you. The experience, even for the illumined, Adi Shankar Acharya says, even for the fully illumined, as long as they remain embodied, the experience, and it is, it's, he, he says it's inexplicable, but it's true that it both is continuous and is not continuous. The universe both continues to exist and does not exist. So the experience is that which stays with you. That which has been experienced. So there's the there's the experience in time, space, and causation. On Tuesday morning at 9.30, the Chandi will be read. We'll have the experience of reading the Chandi. Then having read the Chandi next Tuesday morning at 9.30, there will be the experience, what's left with us from having done that. Thank you. You're welcome, and a very good question. Anything else from anyone? Okay. Now, the Swami has made his representation as to what will happen. And he says, in the Upanishads, 
It is called Turiya, the fourth. In the Upanishads, it is called Turiya, the fourth, transcending the waking and dreaming and dreamless sleep states. It is then that we just know God as I, is it then that I, we just know God as I know you? In fact, I do not know you. I do not know anything at all. I only read what my senses bring to my mind. Immanuel Kant pointed out that the thing in itself remains unknown and unknowable. Let me read that again. In the Upanishads, it is called Turiya, the fourth transcending the waking, dreaming, and dreamless sleep states. Is it then that we just know God as I know you? In fact, I do not know you. I did not know anything at all. I only read what my senses bring to my mind. Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant pointed out, that the thing in itself remains unknown and unknowable. Whereas the seers point out that it is more than known and knowable, it is being and becoming the untying of the three knots of knowledge, subject, object, and process of knowledge. It is not only no it is not only known and knowable, it is being and becoming the untying of the three knots of knowledge, subject, object, and the process of knowledge, those things that arrive to us by our senses. The knot of distinction between subject and object has to be untied to reach unitary consciousness. Now that means that when, when you actually untie the knot between subject and object, there's no experiencer there. How is it possible? When the heart is purified, there is constant recollectedness of God. Now reverse the process. Practice thinking of God, hearing about the ideal, until it gets into your blood, as it were. And then naturally the heart becomes purified. My master used to say again and again, practice, practice, practice. It is something that happens as the result of the practice. Of course, this is what Patanjali says. It's what Krishna says. It's what Sri Ramakrishna says. It's what Holy Mother says. They all say it unless we're willing to practice, practice, practice. And you've heard the metaphors from here about being a tennis champion, becoming a chess master. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, all of this requires long, concentrated, determined, regular practice. My master used to say again and again, practice, practice, practice. There is a line in Sanskrit, adopt any means by which you can keep your mind in the Lord. That is the secret. Now, what does that mean? What is that pointing to? It means that each of us 
is unique, necessarily. I mean, just look at the different faces that appear on this screen. Each of us is unique. That's just the outward aspect of it. Inwardly, we are even more profoundly unique. So we will find our way to that method, that means, as the Swami used, adopt any means. And so each of the yogas, the four yogas taught by Swami Vivekananda, has a suggested series of means, means and methods. But always it is said that eventually your mind becomes your own teacher. And Swami Vivekananda's talk on this subject was published in England as a pamphlet. You can still get a copy of it. It's called Each Man. Of course, everything was said in that pronoun in those days, each man his own sect, S-E-C-T. So adopt any means by which you can keep your mind in the Lord. Once again, it is the great freedom of Vedanta. There's the prescriptions are just a way to get you started. Ultimately, you find your own way. And that is both a great freedom from limitation, and it is also you are now walking your own path. You may feel and be arm in arm with each of the people here on the screen for the time that we're together. And that's very good and very encouraging and very sweet. But ultimately, as you go through your day and night, what will you do to keep your mind in the Lord? What will you do? And so, as the Swami says, that is the secret. I don't hear anyone asking or wanting to ask a question or make a comment. So if that's the case, then we'll go on. When we realize the supreme truth, and Savikalpa Samadhi is that truth reflected still within our experiencing being. There is that, that step beyond, which is, of course, indescribable because there's no one to describe it. When we realize, and that's why the Swami uses the word realize, it's no longer an experience. When we realize the supreme truth, can we express what it is? Has anybody been able to express that? Sri Ramakrishna used to say, even the scriptures have been defiled because they have been uttered by the lips of man. But the ultimate truth of God has never been uttered by the lips of man. It is not possible. That is why you find in the same scriptures, one seer says something, another seer says something else, because they are relative expressions of the same truth and reflect the uniqueness of that seer.
reflect the uniqueness of that seer. And there's great joy in this, this idea that ultimately there is no limitation whatsoever. But on the other hand, that becomes a great challenge. Because without limitations, how do I keep my balance? How do I go on from day to day? As Sri Ramakrishna says, the seer sometimes behaves like a madman like a ghoul, like a child. One seer says something, another says, another seer says something else. Because they are relative expressions, filtered through their uniqueness of the same truth. Though it is not communicable, the truth can be transmitted, not by words, but I have known how my master with a touch could transmit that power. A mystic can describe some of these experiences and they are true spiritual experiences and visions, but they are not the supreme truth. If we stop and do not move onward, we miss the ultimate reality. That often happens. Mystics having some visions or experiences think they have seen God, have realized the ultimate reality, and they do not study anymore. If, if you read the poems in the book, Love Poems from God, you'll see that Ladinsky has selected 12 realized souls who did not stop. But my master told me this truth Light, more light, more light, more light. Is there any end to it? Why is there no end to it? <laughs> because by definition, it is infinite. There is no end to the infinite. Now, of course, as we all sit here this morning, these are words to us, but they are words spoken by an illumined soul reflecting his being that is immersed in that illumination and also in his master and his master's master's being. Sri Ramakrishna had a spiritual son, Swami Brahmananda, Raja Maharaj. Raja Maharaj was Swami Prabhavananda's master. So oh, any comments or questions at this point? The Swami is about to make a little pivot here um, to make a differentiation between what is a real spiritual experience and what is not. Anything? Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, um, I just find um, that this concept of infinitude, infinitude of God is um, so reverential and helpful as I think that even when I get unwanted thoughts, if I think of it as being part of the infinite, it would be easier to release. Then I would be less bound. 
that rather than pushing it out. What a sweet insight, dear. Absolutely. Over and over, these great souls say, how can there be any real imperfection? There is what is useful to us in the moment and what is not. And as you said, if you recognize it as part of the infinitude, it becomes easier to release it. There's no, there's nothing for you to hold on to. It's disappearing into the infinite even as it occurs. It arises, and if we don't hold on to it, it simply passes away. Thank you, Swayam. That was beautifully said. Thank you, Brother Shankar. Hi, Brother Shankar, Samesh here. Yes, Samesh, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Brother Shankar, it says here that uh, the truth can be transmitted not by words, but I've not, I'm, but I've no, how may I, my master with a touch? Is there any master who can transmit by touch and we can just go to him? Should I repeat my question? No, no, no. I'm just trying to think so much. We must deserve that moment when it is transmitted by touch. And when we deserve that moment, then we will encounter that being that can transmit by touch. We may encounter them in a vision or in a dream. They don't have to be physically present. If you want to know more about what I mean by that, contact me privately and I'll tell you. But okay. I know what I'm talking about. I, this, is not, this is not speculation or hearsay. It is the sincerity of your heart's desire for liberation that brings liberation. As long as there is a shadow of reservation, then it cannot happen. As long as you think, well, I do want liberation, but as long as there's that but of any kind, then it cannot happen. And this is why it's required that we practice, practice, practice for some time to get rid of all the buts the ifs, ands, and the buts, the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. All that has to go. And it is hard, Somesh. There's no two ways about it. It is difficult. We didn't evolve to this point capable of our dualistic way of being within universe without it having its effect. But what Swayam just said was so potent when we see what happens to us, what arises in us as just part of that infinitude 
And so there's no reason to hold on to it. It will, if we allow it, it will arise and pass away. Oh, that is a great insight that she had. So we don't get rid of the ifs, ands, and buts quickly, unless we're Ebenezer Scrooge. But even Ebenezer Scrooge didn't get rid of it quickly. It just happened, the, the culmination happened in one night. So that was a very good question, Somesh. Any follow up or anything from anyone else? Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of merging what Swayam said and what Somesh said. And so this idea of, but, right. I have a lot of butts. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. I am the king of butts, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you say so. But, um, that being said, um, I'll, I'll match my treasury with yours. <laughs> yeah totally totally um so so i want to get delve into this idea of um it's all part of god's nature and leela so should we like so i have a desire for a significant other for a relationship for a yeah. wife should i uh you know so so that is part of god so that but is there so indulging in that butt is is the right way to go or um Anshu, only you can answer that question but is there anything wrong with being married no there's nothing wrong with being married and having a relationship and having companionship of course it's all right you didn't sign up to be a monk. Certainly you haven't not. taken any monastic vows. So the only thing you need to do is say to yourself sincerely, if I am to marry someone, I pledge to myself and silently to her that I will do her no harm that I will not imprison her or limit her. I will be willing to make the compromises necessary to make a successful marriage. And that is a real learning curve, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. It is really a learning curve. But if you make the pledge, which is in the marriage vows itself, um. This is why, the Western marriage vows anyway, this is why Holy Mother said, when Nivedita acted out for her, and Sister Nivedita and Josephine McLeod, or was it Mrs. Grinstedl? Anyway, one of the other Western devotees acted out for Holy Mother, the Western marriage vows. Mother said, oh, Dharmi words, these are Dharmi words. It nearly brought her to tears. Hmm. You know, these are, this is a very beautiful. So as long as, as you are willing to be that way with a, a, a good natured, sweet young woman, and you're willing to be faithful to her, then By all means, marriage is an option for you. Shall I tell you get married? Of course, it's not my place. But is it all right to get married? Of course, it's all right to get married. The option is to become a monk, to become a monastic. And you know that in itself is, you have to really 
want to do that. There can't be, there ha that has to be sincere as well. Can I interject something? Please do, dear. Being a monk is not the only other choice. <laughs> I think those are the, that's the spectrum, marriage, family, monasticism. But there are lots of choices in between, especially in this day and age. Um, there are people like myself and many of my friends who, you know, I'm in my 60s, I've never married and that's completely by choice. Um, I, you know, I'm living the way I want, decided I wanted to live when I was, you know, 14. Um, I wanted to work for myself so I could work at home. I didn't want to be married. I didn't want kids. And it was keeping my life simple for spiritual reasons and also creative reasons. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to interject that because I really, I think it's a little black and white to say, you know, well, your only other option is to be a monk. Because thank you, thank you, Sharda, for saying that. And yes, you're right. I was play, painting a black and white picture, more or less deliberately. But yes, your uniqueness will lead you to what is appropriate for you, as That's it true. did for you. And for Anshu and for all of us, ultimately, it's, but sometimes if we have a real strong drive for something, you know, if we need to examine it carefully because marriage and family, that's a, boy, that's a big commitment. It is. Yeah. <laughs> what, and, what is, what is, what is so very important is for us to be self-determined, to do what we do by choice and not just drift not allow ourselves to just drift uh, which is so easy to do particularly now you know i mean there is just the the the, the collective unconscious mm -hmm. is so stressed and so confused and so pained mm -hmm. that it's it, it's it's harder to make good decisions collective unconscious, that's Jung's term. And it is a very good one. You know, there, are, there are other terms for it, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. Mm. Brother Shankar? Yes. Haryom. Haryom Vijay. You described the characteristics of a good marriage very beautifully, so emotionally that my eyes got wet. I wish I had heard it more and more several times from you earlier. Thank you. Second, Anshu, if and when you are ready for the marriage, if you believe you're ready for the marriage, Two thoughts. One, that whoever you are marrying to, let it be between the two of you that you are not marrying, that either party is not marrying for himself or herself, but you are marrying for each other. Right. That way, any semblance of I or selfishness in the act is washed away by talking about it, thinking about it, and sharing that spe special thought with each other. The second, the faith, faith in Taku, that ultimately, it's not about the right and wrong. It's about the surrender that I have done what I can do. Thakur, I give it to you now. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Very nicely said. Very articulate.
I have a question, Brother Shankara. Yes, Nira. Uh, I know you described about, we are all talking about now, marriage or whatever, but uh, is it important that both partners be on a spiritual path to be a successful marriage? Well, it certainly helps, but no. And certainly they don't have to be on the same spiritual path. I mean, just speaking for myself, I had a successful marriage of 47 years. The woman that I was married to was born and remained a Catholic. She was a very self-determined Catholic, but nevertheless, very much a Roman Catholic. And from 1963, when we got married, to 1987, when something happened to her by the grace of the mother, she was worried, genuinely, deeply concerned for my immortal soul. She didn't press me to become a Catholic, but she did try to discourage me gently from the path I was on because of her concerns. After 1987, that was no longer an issue. And the marriage lasted then from 1987 to 2009. So no, they don't have to be on the same spiritual path, though it helps if they are both on a spiritual path, because it gives you a very different view of the materialistic world and what you expect from it. Yes, I, 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 mean, I agree with you totally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, also like I do that. think it's important that your spouse accept your spirituality and not scoff at it, or it's going to be a source of constant conflict. Well, scoffing is a very different thing from what I was talking about with my late wife. But yes, anytime you're being scoffed at, first you have to think, wait a minute, what in me deserves to be scoffed at? Why do I have this karma? Why do I have this karma of someone scoffing at me? Am I still capable of scoffing at others? It seems very strange, but when we stop being able to do the things that we don't like, they stop happening to us. That is a fact. As Goethe said, and again, the pronoun is an artifact of the time in which Goethe lived. Goethe said, a man sees in the world what he carries in his heart. So when unpleasant things happen to us, we have to ask ourselves, why? What in me? Warrants this karma. Thank you, Ramadas. That was, you're absolutely right. Anything else from anyone? Speaking um, of British Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add that in the, in the butt coin market, we are all billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> I love the poem, the, the pun, I mean, the butt coin. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm going to steal that one. I'm going to steal that one. Oh, so I, oh, that's perfect. We're all billionaires in the butt coin market. <laughs> 
Yes, indeed, we are, aren't we? <laughs> it took me a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Yes, indeed, we're all billionaires in the Bitcoin market. Oh, perfect. What a lovely pun. Uh, Brother Shankara? Yes. Speaking of spirituality, the word spirituality can mean different to different people. It's a very broad term. It's a very deep term. And like any word, one cannot limit oneself. And there's no one way for anyone to say how much of spirituality or what kind of spirituality is right for me or for anyone. Well, yes, that's, and, that's, the, that's exactly what was being addressed when the subject of uniqueness was talked about. Each of us the, is unique. And at the same time, how, how we tread that path is also so unique to every individual or can be unique to every individual. A person can go, like in India, we go to the temple, we ring a bell and feel I'm spiritual. Or a person can be sitting in front of the deity for hours in, the, in front of Thakur and just quietly be there. Or a person does not even have to go to the temple and just be walking around as spiritual as anyone. Yes, one of one one of a dear friend uh, does that. Uh, his name is Jerry Brunner, and uh, he uh, he is a he is a wandering mystic. So yes, there's just a few minutes left. I'm not going to uh, start reading the Swami's pivot into definitions of what an is and is not a mystic vision. We'll wait for ne next week. So anything else from anyone? All right, I, I will just say a, a, a few more words about this idea of being on a path. As Vivekananda, and for that matter, many, many great spiritual teachers tell us, we're all on the path. As they say in the spirituals, to glory whether we're aware of it or not. And as Sharda pointed out, there is a great spectrum, a great spectrum of possibility between taking monastic vows and, and subjecting yourselves deliberate, subjecting, subjecting yourself deliberately to those limitations or at the other end of the spectrum, the householder's life of husband or wife and children and all that that entails. There's a wide spectrum of choice, which is why it's so important for us if we're going to move as smoothly and as quickly ahead as we can, to be completely honest with ourselves about what it is that we want. So there's a little formula, without shame, without consideration of others, without calculation of consequences, what I really want is and then keep filling in the blank until you're completely satisfied. Really and truly satisfied, without shame, without consideration of others, without calculation of consequences. 
because shame is one of the most powerful limitations that is imposed on us by society and others. Consideration of others is a limitation that we may impose on ourselves or not. Calculation of consequences is positively comical. All you have to do is reflect on your own life and you will see that you're in no way, there's no possible way that you know what's going to happen in the next minute let alone any supposed future time. It's all projection and it's all nonsense. Now, having once decided what you truly and really want, having really decided that, then you can say to yourself, is there any real reason for shame? And how will this affect others? And do I, therefore, in a loving way, need to make any compromises? And as I said, we can laugh at ourselves for all of those thoughts that we had in getting into where we really filled that blank the way we wanted to about this calculation of consequences. In this sincerity of heart, this self-determination is so powerful because it allows us to set our priorities, has been said by several of us today. We will set our own priorities. So I encourage any of you who is <laughs> a billionaire in the butcoin business to use that little formula, at least experiment with it without shame, without consideration of others, without calculation of consequences. What I truly want is. Anything at all from anyone. Excellent con congregation today, Brother Shankara. That was That's just wonderful. Nice. Wonderful. Yeah, beautiful group. Yes. Yes, very inspiring. Yes. So. O oh, dearly beloved, a flower at your feet for each one who comes to your open door. A flower at your feet for each one who stands by your open door and says, come to me, come to me, offering to break this world's chain that binds us down to ignorance, suffering, and death. A flower at your feet for each one who takes the path that you have struck through this, your jungle world. Om, Amen, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ki Jai Durga 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 May you be safe May you be healthy May you be cheerful May you have peace of mind Go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father Any final thought from anyone? Thank you, Brother Shankara. All Brother right. Shank Shankara, my takeaway message from today is what I don't want um, to happen to me that I don't reflect and not um, do to others. Sort of, I'm, I'm like paraphrasing, but it was the answer, your answer to 
Brahmadas's question about the scorn being scorned. Yes. <laughs> Jaima. Jaima. All right. Tomorrow morning, the topic is self discovery, self actualization, self realization, self discovery, self actualization, self realization through the perspective of Raja Yoga. We're studying Raja Yoga during July. And so that will be the perspective through which we'll see those three topics. Tomorrow morning at 11, for those of you who wish to join us. Okay, thanks, brother. Until Thank you. then, Jai Ma, Jai Ma, Jai Ma. Thank you. Hari.